Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. The story that will be dramatized this evening on the Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, is the story of the Christmas seal. In our audience here at our radio theater is the woman who started the Christmas seal on its way in America 30 years ago, Miss Emily Bissell. We are happy to have her with us, and we would like to have you meet her at the end of our program. As our story is told this evening, we believe you will not only gain a better understanding of the work made possible by Christmas seals, but will make doubly sure that every Christmas card or letter or package you send carries at least one of these stamps. As our overture, Don Voorhees and the DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra bring us a selection of Cole Porter's music from the new motion picture, Born to Dance. evening, the Cavalcade of America brings you the story of a devoted Red Cross worker, her idea for Christmas seals, and the growth of a magnificent campaign for the better health of this country. We take you back to the winter of 1907 in the city of Wilmington, Delaware. 
Miss Emily Bissell, secretary of the local Red Cross, calls on a young widow. Good morning, Mrs. Lang. Oh, Miss Bissell, come right in. I, I was hoping you'd get here. I got your note and I came just as soon as I could. I'm on my way to a Red Cross meeting. I know you're busy, Miss Bissell, but... <laughs> well, what is it, Mrs. Lang? Not bad news about Carrie? No, it, it isn't that. The baby's fine. All she needed was to get to the country. To have fresh air and better food than I could afford to give her. Oh, I'm so glad she's doing well, Mrs. Lang. You know, I think the three or four months in our pavilion will send her back to you greatly improved in health. I hope so. Miss Bissell, the thing we're afraid of has happened. Oh. The doctor said yesterday that Johnny has one lung affected, too. Oh, Mrs. Lang, I'm so sorry. Poor, brave little Johnny. All day yesterday, I tried to realize it. But this will... Since my husband died two years ago, my little girl got sick. Now my boy. It doesn't seem fair. Now, you mustn't despair like this. After all, we were afraid of it. We didn't get Carrie away from this house here soon enough. But he was always so strong. I never thought that he could... But we'll get Johnny out to the pavilion right away. Today, if I can manage it. Well, that's the trouble. Johnny can't go. Why not? The doctor said he couldn't. There's no more room, not a single bed. Oh, well, that's ridiculous. Why, there may be some temporary mix-up out there, but there'll be a place for Johnny. I'll see to that. Oh, thank goodness, Miss Bissell. I was sure you'd help me. Why, that pavilion was started just to help poor people with lung trouble, Mrs. Lang. And it's going to cure Johnny, I know. Now, I'll go right down and see Dr. Wales. Mom! Oh, Mom! There he is now. Oh, Johnny. Oh, hello, Miss Bissell. I didn't know you were here. Come here to me a minute, Johnny. He shouldn't be up, but it, it's so hard to keep him put. Miss mm. Bissell, do you know what the doctor told me? He said I'm sick in my chest like sister was. Yes, I know, dear. And you'll have to learn to be quiet for a while. That's hard for little boys, isn't it? Well, it'd be easier if I could go out where my sister is. And that's just where you're going. Well, I'd better get started for Dr. Wales' office right now. Goodbye, Johnny. You'll get back into bed now. I will. I'll be waiting for you, Miss Bissell. All right. Goodbye, Mrs. Lang. I'll hurry back. Goodbye, Miss Bissell. Thank you so much. Determined to see that Johnny has not denied the opportunity of entering the pavilion, young Miss Bissell hurries to Dr. Wales' office. Well, good morning, Emily. Good morning, Joe. Well, I see by your face that you've heard the bad news. Well, what is it? What's the matter, Joe? Oh, the pavilion is closing in two months. Closing? But it can't. What's happened? Well, there's no use blaming me, Emily, nor any of the three doctors working with me. Oh, well, I'm not blaming you, Joe. Well, there must be something you could do. I barely support my own family. I have more of my time than I can afford to charity. I can't follow that with all the money I have. No, of course not. But, oh, you've worked so hard to start the pavilion. It was such a generous thing to do. You taught this city how to care for its sick. Now, if it's simply for the lack of a few hundred dollars... Oh, the lack goes deeper than that. When money is missing for a charity like this, it's only because the public lacks knowledge of the need. So many people consider tuberculosis hereditary and incurable and think nothing can be done about it anyway. So the worst pestilence in the world goes on unchecked. Pestilence? Yes, it is a pestilence, Joe. I never thought of it just that way. I should have, though, because the Red Cross was organized to help in war, pestilence, and famine. Maybe they can do something. Well, you're the secretary of the Delaware Red Cross... It's up to you to start something. But, Joe, you mean you want me to, to, to go out and find money for you? To manage everything? Yes. I've selected you to get this money, and I feel sure I'm right. It's only possible to stamp out a disease when people in general, not just doctors alone, join a health crusade to destroy it. Well, I wish there was some way to end tuberculosis completely. Well, since tuberculosis is preventable, there are ways. Teach people how to safeguard their health. That's a matter of public education, Emily. So perhaps when you finished a local campaign, you could start a national one. You're outlining a rather large program for me, Joe. <laughs> and all this talk of prevention is too late to help people like little Johnny Lang. Yes. 
thing we have to worry about right now is our local problem. How to care for Johnny Lang and the others. So it's still up to you, Emily. Huh. I can't think how to start going about getting money. Well, you must have some ideas. Oh, dozens, but none any good. I thought of fancy dress parties, or, or a raffle, or tag day. But the trouble is that people are so busy getting ready for Christmas that they haven't time to think of anything else. They're all buying presents and getting off their letters and their cards. And... Now, there's an idea. Hmm? You thought of something? Did you happen to see an article in the Outlook recently by Jacob Rees of New York? No, I don't think I did. Well, it's told about a plan used in Denmark for raising funds for charity. They issued government stamps, rather like postage stamps. And people buy them and put them on letters to help a children's sanatorium. You see, it supports the sanatorium's needs, and it spreads the message. Stamps. Hmm. Well, might be something in it. Of course, the government doesn't run charities here. Hmm. And besides, we need education more than money in this. Now, let me think. Let me put things together. Pestilence. The Red Cross. Education. Christmas. Joe, I'm getting an idea. A big one. Well, you decide about it, Emily. You're a sensible, energetic young woman. Any town that hasn't got a few women like you in it might as well go back to grass. Oh, yes, but you ought to help me decide what... Excuse me, Dr. Wales. Sam's been waiting ten minutes to drive you over to that tonsillitis tent. Oh, all right, Ruth. Emily, I have to rush off. Since this cold wave, you won't find a doctor in town who will have time to help you, but uh, good luck. Well, I, I, I don't know where I'd get money to print the stamp. Borrow it from somebody. And I suppose you have to design a stamp before you print it. Do it yourself. All right. I will. A holly wreath, the Red Cross, Merry Christmas. That's easy enough. Well, everyone in town will laugh and say I've got some silly notion that won't work. But I don't care what they say. I'll be too much haunted by what a failure will mean to Johnny Lang and, and the others. Maybe that fear will help me make it a success. <laughs> With the financial backing of two kindly friends, which amounted to only $40 and was never called on, Miss Emily Bissell designed a stamp and found a printer who would wait for his money. She wrote to Washington and got permission to use the insignia of the National Red Cross for her venture. On December 7th, the day the sale in Wilmington is to start, she pays an early morning call. Johnny! Johnny, are you in here? I'm here. Mom's work. Oh, maybe I woke you up. If I did, I'm sorry. No, ma'am, you didn't. I was just lying here, thinking. Gee, all the packages. It looks like Santa Claus. No, Johnny, these aren't Christmas packages. I'm on my way down to the post office. I've got some signs to put up, and some boxes. Look, look here. Can you read this sign? Christmas stamps. One penny a piece. Issued by the Delaware Red Cross to stamp out the white plate. That's right. What's this underneath? A poem? Hmm. Put this stamp with message bright on every Christmas letter. Help the tuberculosis fight and make the new year better. These stamps do not carry any kind of mail, but any kind of mail will carry them. Well, that isn't much of a poem, Johnny, but it was the best we could do in a hurry. And anyway, we won't be able to judge this poem until we see what it does for you. Is it going to do something for me? That's what I hope. You know, we saw the Postmaster General in Washington. And they're letting us sell these stamps, see? With the Red Cross and Merry Christmas on them. I can sell them right in the post office. Not at a stamp window, but at a booth in the corridor, all trimmed for Christmas. Yeah, but what for? To get money. So that you can go out to the pavilion. And so the others can stay there. Just a little stamp. Oh, dear. I'm afraid you feel about my plan like everyone else does, Johnny. You think poor Miss Bissell's got a bee in her bonnet. No, I don't think anything's wrong with you. Fine. That makes me feel better. The other people think I'm just plain... Well, never mind. I I've got to go now, Johnny, so I'll just wrap up this sign again. I'm very glad you came to see me. I just had an idea for some reason that... Well, it would bring me luck if I stopped in here. 
And all day long, no matter how many people walk by these stamps with their heads in the air and don't buy any, I'll think about you and keep on trying. Mom says you'll do your best. Johnny, would you like to help me, too? Take one of these stamps, will you? Sure. Should I tear it off? That's right. Now, you keep it by you, Johnny. You might say a little prayer. It's pretty looking. Merry Christmas. If people will only buy them, that's what we'll have. A Merry Christmas. Emily Bissell quickly found that she was trying to sell stamps to a public unprepared to understand them. But the newspapers were her best helpers. All the Delaware papers played up the stamps. Soon after the sale starts, she goes to Philadelphia and talks there to the Sunday editor of a paper that has interested itself in health campaigns. I'm sorry I can't use your story on the stamps in our Sunday section, Miss Bissell. But this isn't exactly the season of the year that people want to be depressed. No connection between a terrible disease like tuberculosis and a great holiday like Christmas. Oh, but there is. There is a real connection. Well, when people are filled with goodwill, they want to pass it on. I'm certain I'm right about that. Well, even if you are, this, this stamp idea is a little unusual. You don't have to explain. You think it's silly. Well, perhaps it'll work. I don't want to criticize. It won't work, and we have plenty of newspaper space. One of my business friends loaned me two men to prepare news material. Both of them say we must get more publicity if we can, or we can't sell enough stamps. And I don't think our interest in ending disease is quite the same, Miss Bissell. You're working for a local charity. We're interested in a national campaign. Yes, but these stamps could be used anywhere. Don't you see? I'm afraid I don't. Well, then I, I haven't explained it clearly. I'm not discouraged, though. You see, we're selling stamps at home. But the stamp is bigger than that. Perhaps the lives of so many people, some of them little children, depend on this. The stamp is a symbol. The banner of a great battle against death. I wish I could do something. I'm sorry. Well, I know you're anxious to get back to your work. Thank you for seeing me anyway. Thank you for coming in. Goodbye. Good day. Can I do something for you, lady? Oh, um, that office door says Mr. Hodges. Isn't he the one who writes The Optimist? Sure. It's a good column, too. Yes, I always read it. I'm, I'm an optimist myself. I, I'd like to talk to Mr. Hodges. Oh, that's easy. Mr. Hodges likes to meet people who read his column. Take just a minute, please. Hey, Mr. Hodges. Hello, Danny. Lady out here in the hall to see you. Why keep her in the hall? Door in. All right. Come right in, ma'am. Mr. Hodges ain't busy. Well, I... Uh, oh, dear. I suppose I may as well. How how do you do, Mr. Hodges? Well, please come in, Miss... Uh, uh, Danny didn't give me your name. I'm Emily Bissell of Wilmington, but I won't take up your time. I happened to mention to the office boy that I liked your column so much, and I, I wanted to meet you. <laughs> well, don't go away. Sit down. Any writer likes to talk with his readers, you know. I'm a rather low-spirited public right now. I've just been asking a favor of your Sunday editor. Oh, and didn't he give it to you? No. Well, perhaps I could help you some way, Miss Bissell. Mr. Hodges, did you ever have an idea that was certain was perfectly wonderful and, and then find out that most people couldn't see it? Well, maybe you haven't taken your idea around to enough people yet. Is it uh, something you're writing? Oh, no. No, it's a selling plan for a charity campaign. Would you like to read the outline I've written up about it? Well, thank you. I was afraid I'd get tongue-tied with the Sunday editor, so I put my chief arguments on paper. But I used them all and still... A campaign against tuberculosis, huh? Uh, this paper's very much interested in that. I know. That's why I made the trip up here to Philadelphia. You see, the campaign in Delaware is going well. Club women and the schools and the press are helping. But I thought that if an influential paper was already interested in the subject, we could go far. Isn't my idea bigger than Delaware or Philadelphia? It's the new tuberculosis Christmas seal stamp. Stamp? Could I see the stamp you've designed? Yes, I've got some in my purse. 
There. Thanks. I'm trying to place it in the Philadelphia stores, but they're not enthusiastic. If I could just find one person who would agree with me on the possibilities of selling seals, I'd feel better. You want to find just one person who believes in Christmas stamps? Well, you found him. Uh, pardon me a second. Danny. Uh, what is it, Mr. Hodges? Go tell the editor. I've got to see him right away. Well, what shall I oh, tell well, you? Well, I saw about? the editor, Mr. Hodges. You yeah, some saw the Sunday editor. Now you'll see the managing editor. You see, Miss Bissell, we've been hunting for months for a way to dramatize the fight against tuberculosis. And we knew that when we found it, it would be some perfectly simple thing that we'd wonder, why didn't we think of that a year ago? Well, you found it. How many stamps have you got with you? Why, about ten. Well, we'll want 50,000 for Philadelphia. 50,000? But, but that's all we had printed. Then you'll have to print some more. Hurry back to Wilmington. Telephone me tonight. Oh, I, I will. Why, oh, what grand news this is going to be for the people back home. And for Johnny Lang and the others. It's all the Christmas present they'll need. Say, Mr. Hodges, the boss says, what's it all about? He's kind of busy. Tell him to put everything aside. We found a way to help stand out tuberculosis. <laughs> The faith of a handful of people launched the Christmas seals to end tuberculosis. The first year's sales totaled $3,000. The next year leaped to $135,000. The sale of Christmas seals over the 29 years the campaign has been going on has amounted to $83 million. And the educational results? Tuberculosis has dropped from the first cause of death in this country to the seventh. In every city, there are scores of men and women who have Christmas seals to thank for their present happiness. This year, on a street in Wilmington... Oh, uh, just a minute, driver. I think I see someone I know going down the street. You better get in the cab right now, mister. I haven't much time to catch your train. Why, it is she. Uh, you wait here just a minute. Okay. Hey, ma'am. I beg your pardon. Aren't you Miss Bissell? Why, yes. Yes, I, I am. Perhaps I ought to know you, but... Oh, just look hard for a minute. Of course, I had put on about three feet and over a hundred pounds, but... Why, Johnny Lang. <laughs> Why, it must be 30 years since I've seen you. Ah, you don't look any more like little Johnny Lang. I should think not. I'm as fit as a fiddle. Say, meeting you is great luck. I'm only in Wilmington for a day. Came east on a business trip. Well, tell me, how did your family make out in California? We've been fine. Mother's pretty well along now, you know. And mm-hmm. Carrie's teaching school up in Seattle. And fine. me... I've got a wife and three kids, just an old married man. Oh, John, I'm so glad to hear it. Remember the day you came in to see me on the way to your first Christmas seal sale? Oh, do I remember? I was never so thrilled in all my life. And you gave me the first seal for luck. (laughs) And if you ask me, John, it was lucky. It was lucky for me, all right. Every time I see a Christmas seal sale, I remember that it's going to be lucky for some other fellow. Well, I'll bet you're on your way now to the nearest stand to ask how the sales are coming on. Well, as a matter of fact, John, I am. We hope for a good year. You know, John Lang, you ought to buy some seals. You no, know, you can't catch me there. I, I got them in my pocket someplace. Oh, uh, that's fine. Honestly, Miss Bissell, I don't know how to express the thanks I owe you personally and the other people who helped me. Uh, the people you're indebted to were the people who bought seals that first year, John. And we'll never know who they were. Well, to them, and to you, and to everyone who helped, thanks. Better hurry, sir. Better hurry. Uh, There's my taxi driver. Reminded Uh, me I have to catch a train if I want to spend Christmas with my family. Well, you run on, John. Don't let me keep you. And give my love to your family. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. And good luck to your Christmas seal. Millions have been brought back to health. Millions have avoided the tragedy of illness. But the work has by no means ended. Tuberculosis still takes more lives between the ages of 15 and 40 than any other disease. The national and local tuberculosis associations throughout the country continue their work untiringly, confident that the American public, which has brought them so far on the road to success, will continue in its faith and generosity.
And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce the lady that made all these things possible, the organizer of Christmas seals as an increasing force for combating tuberculosis in America, Miss Emily Bissell. <clears throat> I am delighted to be present this evening to hear this story of 30 years ago. I assure you that it is accurate. I have known many young Johnnies and Carries once ill who are now leading healthy, normal lives. Children of today are much less likely to be infected because of the educational work of the Christmas seal. It is the great symbol of prevention and cure. In cutting down the death rate between the ages of 15 and 25, for this year, for the first time, no one under 19 has died of tuberculosis in Delaware. I want to thank personally every one of you who have helped us carry our campaign forward through this interesting dramatic sketch. Thank you, Miss Bissell. This evening we salute those marchers in the cavalcade of America whose work makes life healthier and thus happier for all. Any effort to save lives and guard the public health concerns everyone. Let us therefore review the advances that have been made. A baby boy born in 1850 could expect to live on the average about 38 years. Today's child can look forward to a life span of 60 years or more. How has this been done? One of the factors in lengthening our average span of life <clears throat> has been the remarkable forward strides of medical and surgical science. Another has been the achievements of chemical research in producing new and better medicines and other products that serve the medical profession. Doctors say that tuberculosis, for instance, can be cured in virtually every case if treated early. One reason the death rate from tuberculosis used to be so high was that doctors, with the methods of diagnosis then known, had difficulty in detecting its presence in time. The discovery of X-ray gave the medical profession an important new tool to aid in diagnosing tuberculosis and other respiratory diseases. By taking X-ray pictures of the lungs, doctors can detect the presence of tuberculosis in its various stages. DuPont Research has contributed to this forward step by perfecting X-ray film that enables doctors to get clearer pictures of the human anatomy than ever before. Another important aid to physicians in diagnosing trouble is the group of products known as biological stains. These chlorine compounds, when applied to samples of body tissue and the like, make it possible to see, by means of the microscope, tiny organisms such as streptococci that otherwise would not be visible. These stains thus enable doctors to diagnose a variety of diseases in time to check further ravages. Once we were dependent upon Europe for almost all the biological stains we needed, and when the supply was cut off during the war, our physicians and hospitals faced a grave situation. Today, DuPont supplies a variety of dyes for these important diagnostic aids. The DuPont Company also makes chemical ingredients for many of these products that aid in the conquest of disease. Its contributions to the protection of human health give deep and lasting meaning to the DuPont phrase, better things for better living through chemistry. The man who had two careers, the interesting story of Samuel F.B. Morse, artist and inventor, will be the subject of our broadcast when next week at this same time, DuPont again presents The Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.